Hello, everybody. Welcome to another session of really breaking down the uh, application process to business school. My name is Liza Wheel, and I am the founder of Gatehouse Admissions, and I'm delighted to be here with you tonight, today, whenever you might be reviewing this on YouTube, and a big thanks to GMAT Club for hosting uh, the event. So if you are watching this live, I have to say kudos to you. You are well in advance um, because tonight we're going to be talking about the online application. You're probably thinking, what do you mean the online portal where, where I enter my name before I hit submit on my business school application? And my answer is, yeah, that's exactly actually what we're going to be talking about tonight. So if you're tuning in live, um, chances are the applications for the upcoming application season aren't even, or admission season aren't even released yet. Um, but that's okay because you're going to get some notes tonight that you can take a screenshot of and remind yourself of, or you can always come back to this once the schools actually start um, releasing their applications. So definitely super important. And look, I wouldn't be having a session on this part of the application if I didn't feel like it was really important. It's also what we've heard from admissions committees themselves. So stay tuned. And please, if you have any comments or questions during the event, I encourage you to enter them. I will um, take them at the end of tonight's session, but I always like to um, answer questions when I can. Um, and definitely you can see all of uh, the, the nine part series on YouTube. Um, so you can definitely check it out um, and definitely give it a like if you're enjoying what you're watching tonight. So here's a snapshot of the entire application process broken up into nine different sections, just bite-sized pieces for you as you work on your MBA application. We have already covered a lot in our first uh, six sessions and tonight is session number seven. So in the past six sessions, we've covered everything from how to build a resume for business school. That is not what you use to get a job. They're very different. So definitely take that, check that out if you haven't. How to think about recommendations. And then we spent two sessions on really the writing aspect, the writing of the essays. It's a huge component of the application. We barely scratched the surface, um, but that's what we did over the past two weeks. Um, and tonight we're gonna talk about the online application. Next week, we're gonna talk about some of the oddball application type questions there are out there one minute videos, for example. And then we're gonna wrap with a session on the interview. My hope with this entire uh, series is that you can come and go as you please, as you need it. Um, when you are getting ready to work on your resume, check out the resume one. When you're getting ready to work on the online application, you know the one to come to. Um, but do me a favor, when you think you're ready, try to remember to be ready about two weeks earlier because this part of the process people always forget and are always on a scramble on. So let's talk and dive into what we're gonna cover in this session. So um, by the end of the session, here are the objectives. Uh, you will be able to recognize the different kind of online application questions, um, recognize the challenges with the online application. Why is it so hard? Um, and probably surprisingly so, because again, it, a lot of it might just be answering questions like, tell us your name. Um, but then, um, it, then I'm going to share 10 tips to working through the application. And then we're going to see some examples in, um, in action. So let's talk about what we're, what we mean when we say the online application questions. So just quickly, when you're applying to business school and you might've gone through a similar process when you applied to undergraduate as well and used um, some sort of online portal. So it's the same thing. It's the, when you're applying to business school, you are going to submit your application through the online porter, portal, believe it or not, back when I applied, I don't know how much we did online, but there might be a lot of, a, a fair amount, but not everything, not like we, uh, they have today. Um, so uh, I actually, just as a, as a background, I did my MBA, I pursued my MBA at MIT Sloan um, and had an amazing time and is surely why I'm here um, doing this now and coaching people on their own journeys to business school. But it was a while ago. So um, the online applications, it's an online portal where, where you're going to enter your information, you're gonna enter your essays, you're gonna in, uh, enter in the information on your recommenders. It is 
the really the place where all of your candidacy resides as far as the admissions committee is concerned, at least until the interview process. Okay, so there are several different kinds of questions, some easier than hard, uh, some harder than others. Um, and really, the some of these are really easy. So just yes, the, the important thing to know with these um, online application questions, some are just the biographical uh, information, your name, your middle name, do you have a preferred first name, this kind of like there, there is no real challenge here. The challenge is answer the question, not hard. These are easy, don't overthink it, just do them, okay? The second type of question, the schools embed a lot of questions in their online application just to do some stats collection. Um, they might ask you what your pre-business school industry was or what you majored in. Um, and it might often be a drop-down list. When it's a drop-down list, just think of it this way, they're trying to capture information so that they can just have an easy way to do analysis. Not surprising, right? Um, I'm sure a lot of you are currently do analysis and you know the benefit of a drop down. Um, my biggest headline, and I'll say it again later, don't overthink, you're, you're not going to get in or be excluded because of what you answer in one of these things. The minute I said stats collection, you might be thinking, oh boy, uh, there might be a way to gain the system so I don't either seem overrepresented or maybe underrepresented, what it, whatever it might be. Don't overthink. Just answer the question to the best of your ability uh, based on the choices and be done with it. But that's another reason that the schools ask these questions is just to gather some stats. Um, the other thing to note is that the schools use these questions um, to gather sort of a consistent resume. I'll often hear the question, why are they asking me um, for my job? It's on my resume. So should I put a different job in the online application? The answer is no. You should put the same information, right? You should be consistent. But remember that if you've gone to my uh, session on the resume, um, we talked a little bit about how you want to use a format or a template that the schools are used to. But even within that, you have choices about what information you include in a resume and what you decide, I'm not gonna show on my resume. Maybe you're not going to include internships. Maybe you're going to skip uh, an early job in your career. Those are decisions that are completely valid to make, but the school wants to, often they want to make sure that they get a consistent amount of information from everyone. So while it might feel redundant to you um, to enter the information, they might ask for like list three awards because maybe you didn't include awards on your resume. Maybe you did, but now you'll have, have to enter them in the online system so that the school can get that information. It's the same with, and I have a screenshot here, it's probably coming up pretty vague, um, but the big thing here to know is just, you know, they're going to ask things like, your start date, your salary information, your job description, the name of the company, the title, things like that. They just want to make sure that they can get that information. And quite frankly, they will use this uh, in a background check. I actually don't have that point anywhere in the presentation. It just came to my mind, um, which the big overriding thing in all of this always is to be honest and truthful um, and, and forthright about the information. Um, don't let that stress you out. But the point is that they want this information also to just gather it, make sure it's consistent, and then they will use that to tick and tie um, if you are um, fortunate enough to be admitted to a program to make sure that you pass that background check before you actually matriculate. So that's the third reason they ask these questions is they want certain information. And by asking these questions in the online application, they are certain to get it. And then the last reason or uh, the last, um, you know, rationale or what's behind these online app questions, it's really an opportunity to, for schools to learn more. Um, might be an opportunity for them to stay current, to understand what's going on in your industry. It might be an industry they don't know anything about. Um, and it's also a chance to get to know you more, uh, again, um, to understand a little bit about how you choose to answer different questions. So don't overthink that. Don't be like, huh, how should I choose you? I'm gonna give you some really good tips tonight, but just know that by asking questions, so I have two examples here, Harvard and Stanford. 
Harvard asks uh, for your key accomplishments in each of your roles and the most significant challenge. It's up to you what to decide to put into that online application as long as you're answering the question. Um, but they are going to get insight into who you are as a result of that. Um, Stanford, the Stanford GSB asks, for example, the nature of the organization of the employer's activities. So what they might be doing is trying to understand what your company does. Take advantage of that. Take advantage of that time to educate the reader on not only what your company does, but your ability to communicate it. Remember this uh, one thing you have certainly heard me say, and you'll hear this again when we talk about the interview um, as well, is that the application process is a test of strategic communication. So make sure that you're being strategic and showing them your communication skills. Okay, so those are really the four buckets. And I would say these ones, the ones that you actually have to think and deal with really tight uh, character limits, you can see on the screen here, um, Harvard gives you 250 characters for some of its questions. Um, the Stanford GSB gives you up to 320 characters. These are short responses. So you want to think about how to craft them. And I'll tell you on the complete opposite end is London Business School. They have questions where you might describe your role in no more than 400 words. 400 words is a, almost as long as one of Kellogg's main essays. So you can see you can really run the gamut, but these are the types of questions that you're really gonna spend the most time on because you want to optimize the space that is allotted to you and you still wanna make sure that you're demonstrating um, you know, strong uh, strategic communication skills. Okay, so these are the hardest ones, but some of the other ones too, I'm gonna give you guys some tips on just so that you're aware. Okay, so you've seen the questions, but they don't look so hard. Well, what makes them so challenging? Well, I already alluded to one, the first one. They often lead you to second guess. I can't tell you how many people that say, okay, so for my career goals, I'm worried that everybody is going to say consulting. So I was thinking I should say healthcare uh, for the industry, but then maybe consulting for the function so that they don't think that I'm just another person who wants to go into consulting. If you, that could be, you know, your path that you're going to enter a company, a, a healthcare company, and then the function's going to be consulting, but probably it's going to be consulting is the, the um, industry and consulting is the, the function. And in this situation, that's totally okay. Really don't get tripped up in the stats like, oh, can I try to seem different by putting myself in a different bucket? They can see right through that stuff make the best choice that is for you and just go with it. Don't try to, don't second guess or don't try to, you know, think about if there's some way to game the system because there's really not. So the best bet is just come up with the answer that makes the most sense to you and go with it. Um, another challenge with these questions is that they feel small. So a lot of people will just treat them small. And what I mean by that is they'll cut and paste from their resume or they'll just not use the allotted, uh, the allotted space, they'll use jargon. They'll be like, oh, it's a throwaway, but it's not a throwaway. These really can add more depth to you as a candidate um, and know that a lot of your peers are going to use these online applications strategically. So you better be one of those people who use it too. And likewise, you know, even if your peers aren't, then this is a time to better shine and give them a more robust picture of who you are. Um, they really do, another challenging thing is they really do vary a lot from school to school. I just had an example of that. London Business School gives you a lot of room um, to explain your current role, your accomplishments, the way your organization is structured, where, um, we just looked at Harvard, they'll ask you to ask for your most, or they'll ask you about your most significant um, challenge and give you 250 characters, which is approximately one, one and a half sentences to communicate a lot there. So, and then there are a lot of in-betweens. I would say another one that's a little different, MIT Sloan really doesn't have much as much of an online application. In 
in these sort of uh, colorful questions. And they, nor do they really have that, that they're trying to gather a consistent resume. Um, there's very little additional information that you're expected to provide online, um, which makes it harder when you've filled it for other schools, you suddenly get to MIT Sloan and you think it would feel easy, but you wonder why aren't they asking for more information? You just have to trust the process. I think Wharton is another one where you don't get a lot of room to describe, you get a lot of room to describe your awards, but you get no room to really describe your activities and very little for your roles and responsibilities at your job too. So of course, everybody says, I don't have any awards, what should I do? That's okay. But hopefully, um, you know, you're always striving for excellence so that you can get those awards if you need them. So that can be challenging. A lot of what you're going to learn tonight is more, um, you know, can be can be used across schools, but remember to look at exactly what the schools are looking for. Another challenge with the online app questions is that they may not fit your situation. What I mean by that is they might ask a question and you have this, well, but I was in this situation or I'm not exactly sure what to do. And that can send you a little bit down a rabbit hole as well. And what I generally say there is make a defensible decision, make a decision that makes sense and either describe it in the online app or call the school, which I'll tell you about in just a second. Just really though, you're going to have to make decisions in this process and they might, some of them might feel difficult or challenging, but as long as you can come to a decision that feels good to you, they're never gonna ding you for that, for, for making a judgment call that didn't quite fit the, um, fight, fit what they were looking for, their parameters. And, you know, they're just not gonna ding you for that. So make sure you can make a judgment call that's reasonable and be done with it. Um, often I think it's also challenging because these really can seem like a puzzle. I have worked on, I don't know, hundreds of, uh, reviewed hundreds of these online application forms. And it's, it is like a little bit, it's not quite a crossword puzzle, but it's, it's something like a riddle. How do you tell this information in the space that you have? I personally think it's a lot of fun. And I think when you get into it, you will like it too. How, how can I really maximize each of these opportunities? Um, but it can feel like a little bit of a puzzle from time to time. Okay, so that's the challenges. So now, um, and tonight's session is gonna be quick guys. So, uh, um, because there's this, there isn't a ton, um, there's not a ton here. Well, there's 10 tips, but it's one of those things, if you don't know the tips, then you're going to not do well in your application. So I'm gonna go through these 10 quick tips kind of quickly, and then we'll look at some examples. And when I have the slide on with the 10 quick tips, I would encourage you to take a screenshot choop, and then save it with online application tips so that you can um, revisit it when you actually start working on your online application. So number one, open your app early and inspect it, okay? Um, you know, typically uh, the schools will start making their applications available in June and July for the fall application season. As soon as they do, create a login, create your account, and go start exploring. Explore a lot. Start entering some of your job information, for example. I say that because of two things. Until you hit submit, they will not see anything. So do not fret. Go ahead, explore, um, get to know the application. You are in charge of your application. You want to know it. You do not want to wait until the last minute to discover they're asking for something that you've never given any thought to. Um, the other thing here is that the reason I said to enter your job information is that because some schools will have hidden job questions that if you just look very quickly without entering any job information, you won't see the tricky questions like, tell us about your most significant accomplishment or what were your roles and responsibilities. So make sure you click around. So that's the very first thing I would say, put it on your schedule to start looking at the latest by mid-July for what applications are open and then go start creating your online application for all the schools that you're applying to. Okay, number two, um, assume you will need about two weeks to fill them out, not two hours. Really, these are hard. You want to probably the first go around, especially if you're thinking Harvard, Stanford, but there's other schools, Yale, Kellogg, Columbia, um, Tuck, all of these have Ross, all of these have pretty involved online application forms. Um, 
So please don't wait till the night before. Please assume that you're giving yourself about two weeks to fill them out and then do it in stages. Spend five hours cranking it out one night, go back to it, spend another four hours cranking it out, then sit on it, go back and look and make sure that you feel good. Give it, um, look at it in context of the entire application. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but that's really important to do um, to just give yourself enough time to actually perfect this as well. Okay. You might have gotten this hint from uh, my last slide, but do not copy and paste um, and make sure you answer the questions being asked. That's really important. Um, it's tempting to just say, oh, well, I have this on my resume. I'm just going to do a cut and paste. You know, I'm not going to say that you should mix up every word. You can certainly have elements from your resume in the online application, but take that extra moment to make it stand on its own. Make sure it's answering the question. Maybe you've added, maybe you've subtracted. So you can start from your resume, but don't let that actually guide everything. Um, you know, it just shows laziness, really. Think about the question and the spots that you have and then use maximize it and make sure it stands alone. OK, um, I rarely suggest copy and pasting, um, you know, at, only as a starting point and then really make sure it stands alone so that they're not bored reading both at the same time, but they're learning something new about you. All right. OK, so this one, um, obviously, we just talked about the, the crazy limitations in terms of characters in some of these cases. So you want to use the space carefully. Um, my guidance here is you should feel free to use common abbreviations or common symbols. So the ampersand or the at symbol or use numerals for sure. Don't bother spelling out numbers. Um, you can even use like MGMT for management or org for organization. All of those are fine and actually could be good uses of the space. Do not use acronyms that they do not that they're not going to understand. Um, make sure you spell any of them out. I think even GSB said uh, Stanford GSB says this. Don't use acronyms that we won't understand, please. So don't. So be thoughtful. You can certainly use abbreviations, but don't be using things that the schools aren't going to understand. Another tip I usually say is you don't need to write in complete sentences. You don't need I. Um, the I is inferred. It's in, it's implied, I should say, and they will infer it. So you can drop that. I did this and you can just say um, ran monthly reports or whatever you might write. You don't need that I in there. So be strategic and use the space, uh, you know, carefully and maximize it. OK, use common sense. And what do I mean here? So, for example, I um, will get the question. So on Harvard's online application asks for key accomplishments. And I'll often hear, well, gosh, I listed my, my key accomplishments on my resume. So should I come up with new key accomplishments for the online application? That does not make any sense. Why would you have one set of key accomplishments on your resume and now a watered down, second best, kind of lame sounding set of uh, key accomplishments in your online application. Remember, they are looking, they're asking these questions because they want to be certain to get that information for everybody. So if your greatest accomplishments is on your resume, it can also be in your online application. And don't strike it from your resume either. It's okay that it's repeated in, in, um, in both places. Just make sure it's worded a little differently, that you know they're still learning something new about you. But use common sense on, you know, you don't want to cut off your nose to spite your face. You don't want to ignore one of your greatest accomplishments on your resume just because you mentioned it on your online app and vice versa. So even though each, the way to think about it is you want each part of your application to stand on its own. So to be strong on its own, but also be complementary. But in this case, there's going to be some repetition and that's totally normal. Quite honestly, it'd be bizarre if there weren't, if it wasn't. Now, that doesn't mean all of your key accomplishments have to be on your resume and vice versa, um, but it is okay if there's some duplication. Totally makes sense. It's really up to you what you want to choose to showcase, but make sure you're choosing your greatest hits and not, um, you know, runner-ups. Okay, next, think like a professional. 
So this is a common, you know, you would hear this throughout the application process. Um, but if you think about Harvard's question about your most significant challenge, um, it might be tempting to write about a manager you disagreed with or having to work constant hours and banking. You know, it just doesn't show uh, good professional judgment. Um, you know, you probably don't have room. It's really a delicate, difficult thing to complain about your boss um, to business school. It's going to raise a little bit of a red flag to them. Um, so be careful about um, using this opportunity to air dirty laundry um, or also just to sort of complain about work. Be smart right? It is totally fine. There's an example in here that we'll see later to talk about conflicts as a challenge, but make sure it's not either completely predictable. Oh, working all those hours. Okay. Everybody works a lot of hours. Um, and it's never something you want to win on anyway. Um, and also, you know, again, had to work with a very difficult manager, just know it can be dicey. It's not that it can't be done. But I do want you to think like a professional when you're answering um, these questions. And I'll add to that also, um, sometimes people want to put things from high school in there because certainly a lot of times around the awards or activities, I generally do not encourage you to include stuff from um, high school unless it's really, really out of this world incredible. Um, so maybe you were a national you know, a national champion of some sort or another, or, um, you know, you received a, an award that for some reason or another was really, really special to you. I probably wouldn't go with things like National Honor Society or, you know, or um, even valedictorian. I probably wouldn't go with that um, because you are that many more years out of school at this point and the focus is on your professional experience, okay? So think like a prof professional, be strategic. Um, so that's a common theme. But what I mean specifically here is think about all the ways that you are communicating with the schools, your essays, your resume, um, really those are the two big ones, your recommendations. And think about this as potentially a place to either go deeper, um, uh, to be deeper into different um areas of your candidacy or to add color or even to reveal some personal things. Now, I, I know I just said be professional, but dealing with challenges at work, um, trying to navigate across groups that don't get along, for example, or where there's been some historical conflict and you were able to bridge those gaps, that may or may not fit on a resume and you might not have room to tell, to use a whole essay to explain it, but there's certainly opportunity online application to do that. So the reason, one of the reasons why you don't want to, even if the schools um, posted their online applications really early in the process, you probably don't even wanna fill it out too early because you wanna give the rest of your application time to take shape. But then, as you are, your essays are pretty much done, your resumes are pretty much done, you're about two or, uh, two or three weeks ahead of hitting submit, then it's time to think about, okay, what do I want to reinforce? What else do I want to tell them? And what opportunities do I have based on what I've learned and what their online application is? So be strategic, show them a, a complete robust picture of who you are um, and choose how to allocate your stories in the online application to um, strengthen your candidacy. All right, think about context. This one is really tricky. It, it makes total sense when you say it, but it's very hard to put into practice. You know your world inside and out. The admissions committee does not. Um, sharing context can add words, but if you're speaking a lot of jargon, I can tell you, it's not going to stick because nobody's going to understand it. If you use acronyms, nobody's going to understand it. If you just talk shop or talk about a project that has no context or is not readily understood by somebody on the outside, it's just not going to teach them anything about you except that you don't have good strategic communication skills. So make sure even within those tight uh, 
word limits or character limits that you're providing enough context so that anybody on the outside can understand the challenges, the, uh, the accomplishments that you're talking about. Um, so think about that context, okay? Um, all right, two more. And then I'm gonna tell you again to take a screenshot of this or take a actual uh, picture. All right, so we spoke about how uh, both Stanford and Harvard ask questions like key accomplishments and uh, your most significant challenge. So here's what I say about these. Remember, and you, if you came to either of the sessions on the essay writing, you'll probably remember this, that the best accomplishments are actually challenges. They, they start with a challenge. Nobody's really interested in the person who, you know, I always, you know, the good old marathon story. Oh yeah, I ran, I don't know. Well, for example, I actually really did run a half marathon this weekend, but I'll just say, if I just said, oh yeah, I ran a half marathon this weekend, it was easy. That's the story. That 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 doesn't really feel like that big of an accomplishment, right? Um, because it came easy to me. It, it, you know, the the biggest accomplishments are the ones that come at a cost. They're a challenge. So remember that. Um, remember that the best accomplishments usually have a related challenge in there, and it behooves you to tell them what that challenge was. And then conversely. Um, the best challenges are the ones that we can actually overcome too. So sometimes with the most significant challenge, someone will just say, oh, this is my most significant challenge at work. And then you're left wondering, and so? And then what happened? What'd you do? How'd you fix it? And either you didn't fix it, and well, that's not really good, right? Um, or you did, but you just didn't tell them. So uh, make sure that you um, really, when you think about your challenges, make sure you think about how you resolve the challenges as well. And then the the tenth one is remember that the schools can help. So if you remember on one of the prior slides, I said how, um, you know, you might think, oh gosh, this question doesn't really pertain to me because I had this like, you know, I was out of school for between my sophomore year and my junior year. Um, and I wasn't taking as many credits, so I don't know exactly how to report my GPA, um, so I don't know what to do. Um, or, you know, I got a truncated bonus that was paid as a stub. I'm not sure what that means, but it's something I hear a lot. Um, you know, if you've got any questions that are very specific to you, feel free to reach out to the school. They might just say, make a judgment call and then explain it in your optional essay, which is totally fine. Um, make it super clear for them to get, it's totally fine. Or they might tell you, oh, disregard that, just leave that blank, or we don't need that information. Um, I find, and, and I think even when I started coaching, I thought this, I always thought that the admissions committees were a little bit of a black box, that you weren't supposed to bother them. Um, now that not only because I have built relationships with them and spoken with them, I know that's not true, um, but, um, but more importantly, you know, they really are receptive and they they want you. The way to think about this is like, look, you need to obviously use judgment here. I don't want you to call them with every single question, but they don't want you not to apply because you ran into a roadblock um, that such as this. So make sure if there's something that's particular to you, feel free to give them a call or email them, whatever you feel comfortable doing, um, just so you can get some guidance. It's totally fine. They're not going to hold that against you. Okay, so I want you to take a screenshot of this slide or take a picture of it. And I want you to remember these um, when you start working on um, working on the online application. And we got two questions. I'm gonna go ahead and take them now. Um, and I'm gonna quickly uh, show them on the screen too. The first one, do you fill out short answers, application questions before the essay or after the essay or both? Um, so it's a little bit of a mix. So again, I want you, um, as soon as the online app is open, I want you to go on there and start playing around. Fill out the biographical information, um, you know, uh, fill out the biographical information, do the quick hits, um, but anything that is really takes thought, just know what you're asked. So either take, take screenshots of the online application um, and put them into a Word doc, but, hold off on actually crafting your, your, 
your responses until you're done with your resume and you're done with your essays. Because then you just know that you're either filling in the lines here, filling in a little bit more of um, the, the color, or you might be choosing to explore areas or topics that you haven't had an opportunity to explore elsewhere. So start at the beginning as soon as that online app is open, but hold off on any of the thinking questions until the rest of your application is done. That's a great question. All right, I'm going to answer one or two more and then um, I'm gonna do the rest at the end. What should be the format of the short answers? Is it sentences or can one use bullets? Is it one or the other preferred? So the question here, it really depends on how much space you have. So if you have 250 characters, you're not gonna have bullets. There's just no room. Um, you're not gonna have probably even sentences. You're gonna have little you know, phrases where you cut out the subject, or you cut out the eye. You're going to be truncated. Um, some people might just go with one sentence and it can work. So this also, you need to be what's authentic for you. But the schools are totally fine with more of a truncated, a little bit shorter, um, you know, phrases, as long as it's a complete thought. Um, and you can, again, you can imply the I, the subject, if you need to. Um, but of course, if it's, uh, some schools will also give you indications. So Columbia will often say bullets are fine. Um, they'll also say that for the optional essay, which we'll talk about next week. Um, and but for example, if you are applying to London Business School, again, I keep calling on just because it's so much different, 400 words to describe your current role, wow. Um, you know, you're probably using good old fashioned paragraphs and full sentences. So let the let the the actual word limit or count, uh, word, uh, excuse me, character count um, guide you, but don't be afraid to make some calls to better leverage the space. Um, so you're getting, you're focusing on the good stuff and less on the eyes and the, you know, writing management out. Um, okay, let's see. I'm gonna keep going for now. Um, I think there are a few more questions. Um, uh, there's a few more questions, but I'm gonna hold them off till the end so we can keep going because I wanna get to the good stuff of the examples. So let's see. Um, let's see, I'm trying to figure out. I'm not 100% sure I know how to uh, get rid of those. Uh, get rid of the questions now that they're answered, but that might just stay up there for a while. But now you guys know the answer, so that's fine. So let's look at some examples, bad and good. All right, so I want you to, uh, I want you to imagine that you were a management consultant. Maybe you are, and then you're in luck because you can see an example that's relevant to you. But if you're not, don't worry about it. Trust me, there's still some stuff that is going to be relevant to you. So. Let's imagine this person is answering um, Stanford's, uh, what is the nature of the organization, the employer's activities, and you have 255 characters to address it. And this is an okay response. Um, Big Consulting Co. is the world's largest provider of services and strategic advice across industries. Okay, so let me ask you, do you feel like you have a good, uh, um, a good feel of what um, what this company really does. Services and strategic advice across industries. I mean, okay, got it a little bit, right? It's okay, but you have an opportunity to do more, right? Um, so let's see a few more examples. Let's show, let's see a lot better. I mean, this could even be a lot, a lot better, but just wanna show you how easy it is to go a little bit further. So already one strategic choice this person did was to drop repeating the name. The name, lo and behold, is already right there in the biographical information. You have to list the company you work at. So this person has decided, well, I don't want to repeat Big Consulting Co. He said, I'm just gonna jump right in. And that's fine. That's what I mean by these shorter, um, not quite full sentences is totally fine. The world's largest professional consulting firm partnering with small startups to Fortune 500 orgs, see, orgs, short for organizations, on growth, innovation, and transformation. Offices in 26 countries, over 50,000 professionals. Okay, all right. You know, it's still consulting, so it's always gonna be a little vague. And I say that I used to be in consulting. I know it there, you know, it's a little bit of a harder thing to describe what you're, what you do. I used to work at Bain & Company. Um, but at least we're getting a little bit more here, right? 
So this consulting firm work, works with both small startups to Fortune 500s. They're in 26 uh, countries, 50 professionals, or focuses on growth, innovation, and transformation. All right, so that's, that's a better way to do it. I'll show you another example. Um, all right, the world's largest professional consulting firm, the Boston office headquarters specializes in tech, healthcare, and industrials, and partners include Mass General, Medtronic, and Staples. Okay, so now we get, we do a different slice, right? This is a big global company, but this, this candidate has chosen to really focus on the office that he or she is in, which happens to be the Boston office and what their focus is on. You can make any of these choices that you want to, and the okay version isn't bad. It's just probably you're leaving an opportunity to better connect with the, um, to, to better connect with the, uh, con the admissions committee. Um, and I personally think the second two options, again, um, are much better because they, we just get to know the world in which the candidate is working, right? And that is why those two options are much better than that okay version, okay? Use your space, don't be afraid of, of well-known abbreviations. You can make strategic choices um, and you can determine what you want them to know about your job or your company. All right, so now let's look at that one, um, the primary job responsibilities. Um, and we'll show both at the uh, same time, actually. Actually, hold on one second, let's do this one first. All right, so, okay. So it's still again a management consultant. So here's what the primary job responsibilities are. Um, I run, so notice that there's no subject here, right? The I is implied, totally fine. Um, uh, run work streams, do analysis, manage and execute deliverables, own client relationships. Okay, again, I am a former management consultant. I know what these things mean, but I can't see any of them, right? I don't. Even I, you know, it's just very jargony. It's very jargony. And it's not very creative, right? It is very much here are my, my kind of like clinical responsibilities. And, but I'm not really on the outside of it in the admissions committee. How am I ever going to see anything different about this candidate who's a management consultant vis a vis the other? you know, thousands of management consultants that are in the bunch, okay? Let's look at a different example. Um, and again, this is just one example to get you thinking. Serve on teams of three to five professionals partnering with healthcare clients focused on strategic growth questions. Gather relevant data and build models and run option analysis to help inform client decisions, guide junior resources. Example, helped uh, Mass General determine expansion strategy for ambulatory surgery centers. Okay, it's kind of interesting. Now we have an example of a client problem that this candidate solved, and we know a little bit more. The person is on small teams, um, partnering with healthcare clients so that this person probably you will have seen it on the person's resume, but we're hammering it home that this person mostly worked on healthcare cases. And then um, again, he or she brings it to life with giving an example. You don't have to do this, but it's just a way to show you can use a space um, as you want. I will say this though, there's a caveat here um, and, it, and, and it's a reason that you're all good for, um, for watching this still and uh, hopefully the other folks who uh, ch chime in late will stay to this part. Um, I think it's Harvard, well, I know Harvard gives some guidance like you can be creative with your responses. I have seen people that go way too far on that side. So remember that guidance about be professional, uh, be strategic, um, don't go way overboard. Don't try to be like so cute and, you know, funny or out of line. Just, you know, answer the question, but like bring your side to it so that they can see you. So don't go overboard on the creativity. I, I think I had someone once who was like, you know, a, a data ninja. Um, and just, it just, it didn't work. It didn't work because it was almost too, um, trying too hard to stand out. And that isn't is rarely the right strategy. Okay, 
let's look at another one. We're switching. We're no longer a management consultant. We are now a banker. So the banker is answering Harvard's key accomplishments, 250 characters. So this is an okay answer. Close two deals, ranked number one on team. All right, okay, close two deals. We know that uh, uh, deal closing is a big thing in banking when you're doing investment banking. And hey, we all like to um, see people who are ranked number one. So that's great. Um, let's see a better version. All right. So here is um, a lot better. Um, was, see again, um, you can see I'm totally comfortable dropping the I here. So was concurrently staffed on two transaction, only analysts to be staffed as such. Helped both transaction close within two months and recognized by management team as MVP. Earned number one um, in team. Um, and I would have said the person should have said number one spot or ranking, but maybe this person didn't have room. Um, but again, you can see stuff here, right? You can see um, there are, they, they've made some choices to make it somewhat uh, shorter. So management is abbreviated, MVP, that's a generally recognized. Um, if you have any doubt, spell it out. This person decided that they might know that that's most valuable player. Um, but if you have any doubt, definitely don't do it. Um, but okay, this is good. Now I understand why this person, um, you know, why it's a big deal that they shared that they closed two deals because they were done concurrently and it was the only, um, he was the only analyst to be staffed, staffed on both. Um, and uh, this person received the, the sort of accolades of MVP. Let's see one other example. Went from liberal arts student to top rank analyst during first year through volunteering for all modeling exercises. Now running training for un incoming analysts. Staffed on two concurrent deals, both closed. Totally different approach, right? Now this person is talking about something kind of like almost you know touchy feely. Not to quote a, a a class name from Stanford GSB, but it's a little bit more personal. A little bit more, um, some would say, you know. Um, uh, more personal related. I was going to say fluffy, but you know, um, this person's talking more about the key accomplishment was coming up the learning curve and doing really well. That's a strategic choice. This person looked at the rest of his or her application and said, "I want to, I want to emphasize this," and now I have the opportunity to do so. One isn't necessarily better than the other. It all depends on what you want to prove and how you want to use the space. All right, guys. Last one. The banker is back. The most significant challenge, working with a difficult boss, learn to manage up. Okay, you guys know what I have to say about this one because you've been watching. Working with a difficult boss, it's hard to do. It's hard to do. I don't want to say never to do it. Just remember, um, you know, if you're someone, if, if the admissions committee thinks that you're somebody who complains unnecessarily about your boss, that it could be tricky. There are reasons you might need to do it, and I gotcha and I will fully support you, but this probably isn't the best way to do it, nor the spot. Um, okay, but here's a different example of a challenge. On potential IPO, team dynamics were leading to low morale and missed deadlines. Started emailing uh, team each morning to align on goals and celebrate small wins. By deal's end, we felt much more invested in positive outcomes. All right, good. Now I see a little bit of like everybody was not getting along. I did my part and little by little people got along much better. Okay. Um, that's much more better than, or that's much more better. It's much better than working with a difficult boss, to learn to manage up. So the real headline, the thing I want you to take away from this is there's something about the online application with all of its biographical information that you think you have to be like very clinical in responding, but you can be creative um, within the expected range um, and you can use this opportunity to tell them a lot more about you. So don't lose that opportunity, use it and use it wisely and you'll do great on this. You'll never get in because of these, but you can definitely stay in the game and become, you know, what I say, like a stickier candidate. They can fall more in love with you once they get to know you and see, you, see your world through the online application. So be sure if you're coming to this, um, any of my sessions, if you follow, um, you know, a lot of the guidance that I say in these, like, you will be quote stickier and that's a good thing. So use this, use this to your advantage and enjoy them because as I said, it's kind of fun to think of them as a little bit of riddle of how you're gonna use the space uh, to your advantage. Um, all right, so with that, I want to 
flip it over if I can. Um, it's my little computer is cranky and um, freezing. So let's see if this will happen now. If not, we're gonna stick on this slide for a little bit. Um, yeah, we'll stay on this slide for a little bit. I don't know why it's it's getting, it's heating up a little bit. So my apologies guys, but I can't um, flip this, the slide forward. Um, but that's all right, because it was just gonna be on Q&A anyway, which we can do on the slide. But first, um, before we do it, just remember, um, we've got several more sessions coming, or actually two more sessions coming. We've covered a lot. Um, I'm take one second to talk about Gatehouse. Um, as I mentioned early on, I um, am the founder of Gatehouse Admissions. Gatehouse Admissions is a small boutique consulting firm um, coaching folks that are applying to business school on every step of the process, really helping them to get to know themselves and share their stories in a way that is truthful to them and, and also compelling because when we tell stories about who we are, it usually is the case. So um, we, uh, we love what we do and love events like these to share what we've learned along the way with people that are applying to business school. So visit, uh, come check out Gatehouse Admissions if you have more questions. But again, tonight's session was the online application. Next question we'll talk about, or next session we'll talk about the um, the oddball questions. We'll talk about the optional essay in that. I did see some questions uh, today on that. So yeah, I will answer them, but know that we'll talk about that at um, next week's session, as well as like Sloan's one minute video or the video essays. It's going to be sort of a hodgepodge of the different types of essay questions that are out there that aren't necessarily traditional to give you guys some um, feedback on how to deal with them. Um, all right. So with that said, again, for some reason, my PowerPoint is totally frozen. So we're going to be focused on the banker uh, tonight while we take Q&A. But the Q&A should be good. The good thing is, actually, you know what I can do? I can just have it like that. And then we can get rid of it completely. So there are just a few questions I'll take right now. Um, if you have any more, please share them. I'm going to probably still take them um, anyway, just so that I can make sure I cover off on them as well. Um, all right, here's a question. This one's from Bogdan. Um, should one usually or generally plan to use the optional essay? Does it ever hurt to submit one anyway? So teeing up for next week. Um, I will say this quickly. Most people do not use an optional essay. Um, most of the time you do not need one. Um, so really the optional essay in almost every instance um, is really to explain any red flags that you might have, any sort of like if you have a lower GMAT or if there are um, some grades that uh, are lower that you, than you want or um, you have some kind of you know difficult job transition you need to explain. Um, but most of the time, you don't need to use an optional essay. That's very rare. So try to think about it. What I would think about is like, at the end of the day, the admissions team is tired of reading essays, quite frankly. So if you're going to ask them to read another essay, you really want to have a, value, uh, a valid reason and not just to answer a question that they didn't ask. Um, and then the other thing I would just really quickly say there is... Um, Oh, you can also use your optional essay to explain anything in your online application that might not make sense. Um, regarding salary left half year, uh, halfway through year, lower bit bonus as a result. Okay, done. Like super short and brief. Um, that's that's totally fine to itemize anything that might be confusing confusing your online application just by with a quick explanation. Okay. Let's see, um, can we trust that ad comms reviewing our apps and essays are fully unbiased on a personal basis, right about it, LGBTQ or something along those lines, Could neutral to prevent, or neutral to prevent personal bias. So I think, so a few things. We all have biases. It's impossible to, to not have our own biases no matter what we do. I will say for the admissions committee, they are two things, trained to recognize their own biases and work against them. Um, so the schools really do invest in training and uh, an awareness so that they can just you know, be aware of what they ha might have internally that would predispose them to react one way or the other and work against that. That's number one. 
I would just also say, um, it's the same with uh, admissions consultant, the admissions committee, they are on the average deeply em empathetic people um, who are really, well, there's three things actually, who want to make sense of the, the candidate that they are looking at. They, they give you the benefit of the doubt. They want to like you. They already have this impossible, impossible decision of saying no to so many amazing people, but they're just, if anything, they, they're, they want to find a way to like you. So that is also going to help them if there are any internal biases, whatever they might be, overcome them. And then I think the third thing is that the schools are also very committed to building diverse classrooms um, and diverse in all shapes and sizes, you know, every dimension of the word. Um, you know, I have, I, I personally have, um, you know, seeing people, for example, dealing with, you know, on their resume politics, um, and politics can be a very difficult, um, space to be in. It, 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 it prompts a lot of, um, uh, emotion and biases and, um, you know, but you should never shy away from your career or something like that. You, you know, there are ways to explain, uh, not even explain, to communicate what you do and avoid, um, setting off, uh, or, you know, for you on your end to avoid prompting any unnecessary reaction, either positive or negative. Um, but they're also very much trained to try to avoid that themselves. So, um, that would be, I, I think they're great at it is my, my overriding uh, response to that. Um, and then I'm going to just, uh, I, uh, here's a response to that. I also wonder if they are reviewing them equally, even if someone has a subpar GMAT GPA that numerically put them in the, into the return pile. I think they do. Um, my, again, it's for the same thing. The schools want, I'll say a hidden gem, right? They want an amazing story. Um, they want, you know, someone's going to be a future leader. And if that person happens to have a GMAT or GPA or GMAT, low GMAT, low GRE, low GPA, but they have proven to the schools that they can circumvent it and have this amazing story, then I like the schools, the, the readers will read the essays. Now, is it a higher bar to cross if you have a lower score? Yes, absolutely. It just is. You, you have to make up for it. Um, but it's my belief and, you know, I, I, I might be, um, I don't think it's naive. I just, I, I want to believe in the best in people, but I, I am certain they read your essay and they, again, they, they're predisposed. They want to like you. They want to find that connection with you. Um, but it's still in, in ridiculously high bar to cross. Um, okay. Then David, I'm just going to show this said, that's a great session. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anytime. Come back to the other nine. Um, and that's it. I think, um, and then, uh, Moonshot MBA. Thank you. That definitely puts me at ease to hear. That's great. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I, I, from, and I'll, I will say this. <laughs> One of the reasons I love my job so much, what I do is I get to see, and even in doing the free consultations, I can't tell you how many times I learn about just the people I learn about new industries, new companies, new jobs, new like buzzwords that, you know, I've been in this space for coaching for so long. I don't even know about, and I learn about all these things from these bright, exciting, um, you know, uh, young professionals. Um, so I, I really do think we all, anybody that's in this space, um, either admissions committee, admissions coaching, it's really exciting to help people tell their stories. That's why we do it. Um, so that's it, guys. Uh, next week, same time, same place, YouTube. You guys know where to find me now. Um, uh, oh, thank you, Moonshot. I'll take that. I missed that one. All right. Sorry. I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this one more question before I say that. Um, I'm pretty uh, worked five years before going to uni to get my undergrad and plan to go directly to get into an MBA. Could this be a problem? Um, so you worked and then got your, did your university. It's not necessarily a problem. I, I don't think it's a problem. It's just, it's gonna have to be explained and they're still going to have to find evidence that you can be a great future leader. 
Um, it's rare, so we need to make sure that those pre-university years, there's good impact there, there's good growth, and that you then, because you went into university at an older age, maybe you were you know, more uh, mature or could take on different roles because you had had more work experience. So I don't wanna say it's definitely like, it, it's not, again, it's not an automatic like no way, but I do think you wanna explain it and you do wanna make sure that you've, you've benefited from that difference. You've benefited from this change, this slightly different path. It's not that you're like behind, it's you went through it in a different sequence and look at how strong you are as a result. All right, that's my, my final um, comment. I will say, come back next Monday. We're talking about the one-off essay types, um, oddball application questions. And then we'll do a final wrap the Monday after that on interviews. And I know that one might feel way, way, way in advance. So you can um, check it out now. So all of it's fresh when you're working on the rest of your application, but then definitely um, you know, come back to it. Uh, it'll be on YouTube um, and GMAT Club um, when you get to the interview stage. Thank you and come visit me at gatehouse.com, sign up for gatehouseadmissions.com and sign up for a free consultation um, and uh, if you have additional questions. All right, everybody, thanks, take care.